Hello YouTube, welcome to the injury Q&A number three. And we're going to start from the top with the questions from the last installment that was uh, quite a few months ago. And remember one thing, these Q&As might be the most important ones of the series because if you're injured, you can train and if you can train, you, can, you cannot grow. So injury prevention is of the utmost importance. And if you have the choice between accumulating tonnage or actually accumulating tonnage safely, you should always do it safely because what is going to allow you to stay in the game for the longest time is going to be the best way to get big as a natural lifter. So let's get started. I actually took some questions from the q and number two that I couldn't answer. Number one, get strong by 40 asks. I get issues when I press heavy while my forearm meets my bicep. I think, I think it's called the brachialis. Do you think it is because I don't train forearms? I've noticed staying really tight helps, and if I ever let the tightness go on bench, the first place I feel it is right there. So for presses, vertical presses and horizontal presses, but the biggest culprit tends to be the horizontal press, which is the bench, etc. People get pain in two areas. Right there, where the, the bicep tendon attaches into the humerus, and right here, which is what he describes. And it's not a tendon pain, it's not the... It's not the tendon of the bicep in this case, it's this area. And I'm going to tell you that between the two, this one is the least dangerous to have because most of what you're feeling is tension, but it's not surrounding a tendon that could potentially snap. The distal tendon can snap. So what you have is most likely, as we've described, the result of either friction within the body where your technique forces the forearm at an angle it just doesn't like, or it is, as you also described, a potential lack of tightness that occurs at a certain point, which puts the forearm at an angle that, again, it doesn't like. And as you, as you decorticate an horizontal press, you quickly realize that forearm angle is very important. A lot of people don't think about that. They think about their shoulder, and the angling of the shoulder, they think about the elbow, if it's tucked in or not, but they never think about what it does to the forearm. Because in reality, the forearm can be perfectly uh, perpendicular with the ceiling, it can be angled to the side a little bit, etc. And you will find that, usually, for most people, what is going to help with preventing pain is going to be having the arm being completely stacked, so as straight as possible. The second you start doing rotation inside or rotation outside, it creates a weak link in the chain, and that's when pain develops. And I don't think it's really because you don't train forearm. That being said, you can always try training forearm, because considering it takes zero time, and it's not going to drain you, because as I understand you're a powerlifter, you can just throw in like two or three sets of forearm isolation at the end of the day, and see if it helps. What could help, and what I would recommend you do is, try and do some isometric stretch on the forearm because most likely your issue is that you're always doing this. You're always tensing the forearm when you bench, when you squat, when you deadlift, you're always gripping and that's normal. You have to do that, but you're never training this. You're never training the opening portion and the opening portion, while not as important as the gripping for humans, is also a component and a movement pattern. So you need to train it. I can tell you that if you develop the ability of the end to extend and to open, not only are you going to develop bigger forearms, but the pain in the forearm is going to go away because you're going to alleviate the pressure. So what I recommend you do is, and I've made a video in the injury prevention place about that, get some elastics. I know that Iron Mine sells some that are very cheap. And basically what they do is they surround the finger and you open it like this. And you will find that this alleviates forearm pain, uh, elbow pain, shoulder pain, neck pain, everything, because everything starts here and then it goes up. And you will see that it's almost a miracle core, cure, but it makes a lot of sense because you're going to introduce a movement you've never done before. So I hope that helps. You can also try a medicine ball. You just put it in the crux of the elbow here and you put, apply pressure if you, if you want to. But And I'm not saying that it's not going to happen or it's not dangerous. What you're feeling mostly is muscle tension. It's not really tendon damage. So don't freak out, but of course, take care of that pain. After that, this, I believe, is going to be in a different Q&A. And then we have a question from 
Bozidar Tosik, who asks, any recommendations on what to do for forearm splints? So again, forearms today is the big topic, it seems. So, most people are going to get shin splints, which is when you run, and the shin splints come from the repeated impact of your foot against the asphalt as the shock travels up, and it damages the bone little by little. And in reality, it's again, just as I've described before, never something that's going to lead to a freak accident, but it's painful, and if we can avoid it, we want to. Especially because for some people, it also is going to be a representation of a poor movement pattern because it means that you're not directing the energy where you want to and the energy is being sent back into the body. So for forearm splints, a lot of people get them. I personally never get them. What I would say is, one, do the elastic because that might solve it. Two, the med medicine ball if you want, if you can, to roll out the entire forearm because in my opinion, the biggest issue with forearms is that it's one of the muscles that is the most tense. And when the muscle is constantly tense, it tends to calcify in a sense. And a lot of people get that in their traps because they're always like this, they're stressed out with their life. Then they do a bunch of uh, exercises that push the, the traps up because they do a lot of things in internal rotation of the shoulder, so they make it worse. What you want is to be able to get some stretch. So not only are you going to do the, the elastic thing, try to reduce the amount of not necessarily gripping exercise you're going to do, but try and get your grip some rest. Try and get straps. You will find that straps do a funny thing because technically you're still gripping, but you're really not. Because what you're doing is you're preventing the bar from running away. You're not really trying to keep it in place anymore. The, 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 the straps do it for you. And you might find that not only is it going to alleviate the, the demand on the grip for a while, it's also going to heighten the stretch of the fibers because straps are no straps and a lot of people don't get that. When the weight is in your hand, the forearm is being stretched. And since you can handle more weight with straps, it also means that you're going to get a better stretch on the forearms. So try that on for size. In terms of recovery things, I recommend contrast showers at the end of the workout. You're going to let the blast hit the forearm as the water is very warm and then very cold. Since this is going to throw a lot of, uh, of blood flow in the forearm, that this can also help with recovery, etc. Keep in mind for the people who watch this that if you want to jump in and give advice, you are of course welcome. But just as with the advice you receive from me, always attack it with a critical mind. Don't take everything for gospel and actually apply it sensibly. Meaning that you're not just going to get a miracle cure, it's also going to take work from you. So keep that in mind as we go on. 20 Deep, this is technically not something that I would do uh, here, but 20 Deep asks, are there any tips on fixing an uneven chest? More specifically, the right one. The left one is more thicker. Okay, so typically that is going to be due to uh, an imbalance in the shoulder elevation. You have a shoulder that's higher than the other, which means that when you bench, you have one shoulder that sits deeper when you look at the horizontal positioning of the bench, which also means it works more because you go through more range of motion on this one, especially at the bottom, of course. So the pec hypertrophies more, but then you're left with the imbalance. The way to correct that is try to correct your bar path as much as possible. Of course, you're not going to be able to bypass the way your body is built, but as much as possible. And then you can throw in some uh, isometric stretch, you can throw in some uh, unilateral exercises if you want. For the isometric stretch, I personally prefer stuff like bends. So for example, you're going to do a lot of bend movements and you're going to really let it squeeze at the top and then down. I've made a video about that. So you only would do that for the one side that's lagging. And then you can just grab a dumbbell and do dumbbell bench with one hand. And you can throw in two or three additional sets per bench day or chest day, whatever you want to do it like, and that should help to catch on. But Keep in mind that a muscle group that is dominant, especially when it is de-synergistic like this, is stronger for a reason. It's because the leverages of the body make it so. And funnily enough, a lot of people don't think about that, but the better the leverage is, the less the muscle has to work, the less it's developed. So in reality, when people have an uneven muscle, most of the time, the muscle from the other side is stronger, not because it's bigger, but because its positionment is favorable. So you're going to also find that when you're going to try and correct that, the muscle that is the smallest might be 
in a sense, stronger because you have better leverage. So you might sort of be stuck in a rut and thinking, okay, I don't get it. I'm stronger here. I'm getting much stronger on that portion of the muscle than the other. What is going on? Am I creating a bigger imbalance? No, you're not. It's your leverages that differ. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to be uh, to to offer different treatments for different portions of the muscle. What matters is that it catches up. And it takes some time, but it will eventually catch up. After that, we have natural hypothermia who asks, good stretches for hip flexors. So hip flexors, stretches are very important because the more you sit, especially in a chair, the, the tighter your hip flexor gets. And eventually that can lead to issues down the line. It can lead to back problem. It can be, lead to, uh, to uh, issues with ankle mobility, etc. So what I recommend you do is stretch after every single leg day. And I'm not going to actually give you the stretches right now because I'm going to film it for you guys eventually. And I'm going to show my routine after every single leg day. But for the most part, what I recommend is when you're sitting stationary like this, you're going to take one leg and you're going to put it on top of the other leg. So it's going to cross and then you're going to push on the knee and that is going to really stretch the hip flexor. You want to do it very cautiously because hip flexors are very fragile, especially when cold. And if you have been sitting on an office chair for a very long time, most likely they're also very short. And when you're going to try and lengthen them very aggressively, guess what happens? They snap. So nice. Okay. You start very slow. I'll, I'll show you ways to do it on the floor when you do the butterfly and, it's, and everything, but it's something you take step by step. It took you a long time to destroy your hip flexor. It's going to take a long time to get it back. I used to have very bad hip flexor pain and I fixed it with, uh, with stretches. So I'll get that to you guys. And your second question, which is how to fix hip pain during squats. Well, usually it comes from that. You have tight hips. If it doesn't come from your technique that is not suited to your uh, morphology, it's most likely that your hip flexors are too tight. And when you squat, they extend. But since their, the range of motion that they allow because of their shortening is not the greatest, you push them through their range of motion and their zone of comfort and they hurt. And you can tear one, so be very careful. You want to potentially even lower the weight or cut the range of motion a tiny bit where it's, it feels comfortable and not painful until we get your hip flexors under control and then, and then you'll be fine. And you'll find too that once you've lengthened the hip flexors, it doesn't take a lot to maintain. It really doesn't because you have now built a habit of lengthening them, not only through stretching, but also through your exercises that are going to now be full range of motion. So you'll be sort of safe in a way. Personally, I've never, that pain never came back. I have other pains that came back, but this one never came back. Luke Sauter. Hey brother, my sternum occasionally pops if I do dips, but there is no pain. Does anyone know what this is? If, if it's an issue. Okay. So with dips, you want to be careful in a sense because some people have cracked their sternum. They broke their rib cage during dips, but there's a lot of pain involved and I'll make a video about it, but there are certain signs to look out for that predict a freak accident or injury in the gym. And noises are rank very low because your body is going to creak. It's going to crack. It really doesn't mean much. If it's accompanied by pain or a, not necessarily a nose, but a physical sensation that something shifted, then you need to be careful. But even that ranks low for me, pain, physical pain is higher. And even that ranks low. And I'll explain why, but I personally know when that when I do pullovers, this here cracks. When I do overhead press, this cracks. And the reason why is because you have a lot of cartilage here, you have a lot of bones. And if you believe in ribcage extension, what might be happening for you too is your ribcage is expanding as you train to accommodate for the, the muscle you're putting on and to accommodate for the exercise. So I would say for you, as long as there is no pain, it's fine, but keep, pay attention. Don't jump into a massive PR on the dip. Don't go beyond your range of motion. Stay safe, stay regular, and you should be fine. This is not a question, but I'm going to read it because it's important. Ria Axe says, I have ruptured my, my distal bicep tendon while doing a set of inclined dumbbell curls using only 10 kilograms. Going to have to get an MRI, which will set me back 500 bucks. 
My luck, I just have recovered from tennis elbow. I'm getting sick of tendon injuries. Okay, so a lot of people ask me, because I tend to dog on uh, inclined dumbbell curls, why I don't like them. This is why. Inclined dumbbell curls represent the biggest mistake that most people do when they train bicep. They overextend. They go way past any relevant range of motion. Not only does it do nothing for hypertrophy, it also gets you hurt. And the reason why I say that inclined dumbbell curls are the worst for that is because with the way you're sitting and with the angle of the elbows, there is a tendency to want to go lower because you're doing it with a with lot less weight. You've integrated in your head that it's supposed to be an isolation movement. So you go full range of motion and therefore what do most people do? They go all the way, all the way, all the way, all the way. They lock the elbow. Sometimes they go deeper than that and they bounce up. This is not muscle. This is not how you train your muscles. This is how you use the elasticity of the tendon to bounce up. And I'll make a full video about that because too many people think full range of motion equal, equals the best range of motion. It's not the case. The best range of motion is the one that targets the muscle. And this is not part of that game. When you do bicep, you want to keep a flex. The elbow needs to stay flexed to engage the, the bicep. If you go beyond that, you're just going to get hurt. And it doesn't uh, surprise me that this person also had tennis elbow because guess what? This is also a part of that. People who overextend on extension for the triceps, they get tennis elbow because they lock the joint again and again. And tennis elbow can also be developed doing curls with that same issue and that same form mistake. So be extremely careful. And the worst part is that, guess what? What prevents tennis elbow across the board is going to be doing curls properly because you develop the antagonistic muscle of the tricep and then therefore you protect the tricep. But if you add strain on the tricep when you do your curls, the tennis elbow is never going to go away. So listen uh, to what he had to say and learn from his mistakes. Boy. Rice Paddy Fatty 25. I have had a nagging arm string that pops or feels like it plucks mainly when I do wide stand squats, wide stand deadlifts, or especially Bulgarian split squats where it lunges. It seems to be deep where the hamstring meets the hip or glute. No pain running or doing sports, just that specific movement. It's been a nagging feeling for as long as I can really remember, but the last year or so was the worst. I've been doing active recovery and stretching, but I can't seem to get it to stop happening even when lifting really light or no weight. Okay, this is a clear sign of two things. Either you are trying to repeat movement patterns that your body just does not like. And yes, there is such a thing. For me, for example, I cannot squat with a wide stance. It's just not possible. I cannot pull with a wide stance because I have narrow hips and a large waist to go with that. So I'm in that position where I have to go narrow. And you might be in the same disposition where not only is your structure not suited for that, but the way you are, uh, you are articulating the structure around the movement makes it so that certain muscle fibers are being pulled in weird angles and they don't like it. I can tell you that I know what you're talking about and that if an injury were to occur, it would be an armstring tear or a glute tear because it's going to tear where it connects within the glutes. And that is not something you want, my friend. So <laughs> my advice would just be stop doing white stance stuff. Stop doing Bulgarian split squats and weighted lunges. You have other ways to train your legs. That being said, you, you might be concerned that this injury is going to propagate to the rest of your leg days and that could be a possibility. So what I also recommend is stretchers. And by stretchers, I mean active stretchers that develop robust mobility, which is going to be Romanian deadlifts, hyperextensions, which is going to be uh, glute ham raises. All of that is going to provide the lengthening of the armstring that a lot of people miss in their training. And you will find that with time, when the armstring lengthens, it also pulls on the glute, which also lengthens. So you, it's going to be uh, key score effects that is going to really help you with removing that pain. Of course, you want to get into it slowly because you see that the muscle responds negatively to, that, to a certain type of stretch with a certain angle. So you can also infer from that that all types of stretches might provoke the pain again. But the good thing, the good news is, and you might not see it like this, but since the pain has been with you for years, I can tell you that it is most likely structural. It is most likely not something you've done to yourself. It's not a nagging injury. And the fact that it hasn't snapped yet shows that you have a good control over it. 
and that it is most likely not something that is going to result in a freak accident if and only if you are being wise about it. Plus, it's not even affecting your sport, so that's good. And understand that there is nothing that white stand squats, white stand deadlifts, or Bulgarian split squats and weighted lunges cannot be replaced by. They can. Aaron Thel, as you requested, here's my repost of the comment about my elbow issue. I have a condition with my elbow that makes my nerves snap out of its groove on every pressing motion, which prevents me from doing any pressing movement at all. The snapping occurs in the middle of the eccentric phase during elbow flexion. To give a quick update, I have stopped with overhead press and rely only on bench press, okay, as my main pushing movement since it aggravates my elbow the least and lets me use the most weight. However, I miss the overhead press since it has worked wonders for my shoulders and side raises really aren't the same. Thanks for reaching out to me. Okay, so here we're dealing with someone who is an extreme case of what we've just described. He is allergic, quote unquote, to certain movements. And this is extremely rare, but it happens, meaning that across the board, people who cannot do any movement pattern of any style do not exist. That's not possible. But people who cannot do certain types of categories of movement patterns do exist. And here we're dealing with someone who, we, who has a big problem with presses. And that comes from the elbow because a press is not just a shoulder flexion because the shoulder flexion cannot happen without an elbow flexion. And his is particularly vicious because the snap happens in the middle of the eccentric, which is really, I mean, there's no way around that. Most people, if they have an issue at the top of the eccentric or the bottom, you, you can just cut the range of motion short. But here, it's in the middle. There is no cutting that range of motion. So we have to find a way around that. And he, you already started, Aaron, where you focus on bench. And this tells me also one thing. It tells me that what really aggravates your elbows is the action of fighting, uh, fighting against gravity in a straight line. And you might think, yeah, that makes that's I knew that, but I want you to keep that in mind because it's how we're going to attack the problem. You see, bench press doesn't hurt you as much because you're not pressing in a straight line. You're pressing uh, towards the rack. And therefore, while there is elbow flexion, the moment where the eccentric portion of the elbow flexion occurs has still a lot of, uh, of uh, chest involvement in it. It's not the same for the overhead press. The overhead press, when you're past your eyes, your eyes and the bar is past your eyes, most of the shoulder flexion is already gone and the elastic energy from the shoulder flexion is gone. So what you're pressing with is the triceps. This is why a lot of people find that the limiting factor on the, uh, the overhead press is the tricep. And this is why you also suffer so much from it is because it is much more of a pure elbow flexion than a bench press. And that's across the board, true for vertical presses. There are much more elbow presses and shoulder, shoulder presses when it comes to that, that certain range of motion uh, limit or frontier. And the issue is that you miss it. Well, what we're going to try and find is a way to modify that strength curve so that you don't feel the same pain. Have you tried incline presses? Incline presses are going to mimic a bench in a sense because you're not pushing straight up, you're pushing towards the top of your head. And that can also increase the amount of shoulder involvement and limit the amount of tricep involvement. Plus, it tends to recruit a tiny bit more long head of the tricep, so that can be good for you. You can try with that. If you truly do want to keep um, doing uh, the overhead press thing, with a bar might be difficult because as you've, you've uh, described, it is preventing you from doing so because you have to push over you like this with the triceps and the dumbbells really aren't going to be much better. I think they might even be worse for your problem. You can try to do it over press with a band or with a, a spree, but I don't know if that's going to be working for you. I don't know if you want to do a clean over press or if you would be fine with another type of vertical press, for example, I do think that if you can manage to do pike push-ups or handstand push-ups, it would also alleviate the pain because it would also represent much more shoulder flexion. So that can be an option. Something that we can work towards as well is making the, uh, the muscles around the tendon stronger. So maybe for a while you'll have to just put overhead press to the side, focus on building the long head, building the medial and lateral head,
And over time, this is going to create a cushion for the tendon that is not going to be as aggravated because muscles protect tendons. And so this can come from, as I said, behind the head extension with more shoulder flexions and really any type of extension because they shouldn't hurt the, the tendon much. Because again, if you look at it from the standpoint of where gravity hits and the way you fight against the strength curve, you're trying to push down instead of trying to push up. So that should also help. And that will be a sacrifice to you because you're not going to be able to overhead press, but over time you will be able to, uh, to get it back. A lot of people who have poor shoulder uh, endurance and who tear shoulder rotator cuffs or even um, have their shoulder just pop out of the pocket all the time, when they build the real delt and the trap, they get it under control, meaning that now there is a brace of muscle around it and it protects them. And I would recommend you try that route because it's going to work. For you, I can't tell you to ice something but it, because it sounds like it's genetic. It's just the way your elbow is built but you can bypass that with time. So I'm going to leave you with those things and this is going to be that for this Q&A. It was rather short, so you can expect one to come sooner than later, even though we're almost out of question. So if you have more, please let me know and have a good day.